So there's a, a good number of folks who are, are, are having problems with their high vulnerabilities that are actually extending past the, past the, the, the right. prescribed time periods. So that's cool, because that's the, entire pro the entirety of the problem that we're trying to solve. We're going to talk about what is going on there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about where that comes from, because even though this is a very technical room, we're going to, we, uh, we know that there are going to be millions of viewers on uh, the YouTubes over the years. And so we're going to try to make sure that people understand the, the technical background is, or the, the business driver for where this is coming from. This is fairly new. So a little bit about disclosure. Um, we, we have individually worked with most of the major providers in the context of building out one of their static analysis tools. So we're a pretty friendly group to them. We think that's important for you to know. Um, also, we build a automated remediation tool. So there's our bias. We try to keep, uh, this, this is very much not a sales presentation, and, and it's very much uh, kind of just talking about what the industry does. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that you understood where we're coming from. A uh, quick disclaimer, I don't think this matters as much for this slide, but do everything at your own risk, hire your lawyers, uh, don't break stuff that isn't yours. So a little bit about, about us, I'll introduce myself and, and then uh, uh, Demetria will introduce herself. Um, I can't actually read that, so I, I'm not going to. Um, what is this? Oh, thank you. Um, so, I started as a software developer in 98. By around 2006, I was the InfoSec architect for a, a company that was too big to fail. Uh, the, most of my really hardcore uh, manual, static, uh, manual static and dynamic, as well as my automated static and dynamic, was really done with, uh, with Andrew here over at Aspect Security. Uh, we used to, on a pretty daily basis, break into some of the coolest stuff that I've ever heard of. Um, financial networks, uh, more than one global, uh, more, more than one national bank, um, uh, and obviously in the financials that we just, uh, you know, just stopped paying attention to it. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a project, and we ended up building out an, an AI. Uh, we'll go into that in a little bit of detail. Uh, I also hacked for fun, uh, a digital nomad, social dancing, photography, and this is Demetria. Uh, hello. Um, so I am the COO at Fozzy Logic, but my background is in data science, and then before that, business analytics. Um, so a lot of what I do is manage both the data and the, well, the business uh, functionality uh, within Fozzy Logic. Um, see, background, uh, a lot of that fits into uh, software product development, and then uh, specifically fits data-related uh, products. Um, so it's fun stuff. I like a lot of rock climbing blues dancing, and go on adventure photography uh, trips quite frequently. Even if I have to bring my laptop. <laughs> so I, at this point, I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to more or less stay here, uh, it's just so the camera person knows that uh, it'll be easier to, to keep a hold of me. Um, so you're going to find a lot of times the slides are saying something and I'm talking about something slightly differently because I assume that you can read while I'm talking. If that's not the case, please uh, go ahead and, and lift uh, your hands up. And I'm immediately going to start walking again. So sorry, camera person. So about mid-2000s, I'm uh, I've just taken reign of a uh, assessment for about 2,500 projects at a bank that's too big to fail. Um, we go into the, uh, into the room, there's about 20 to 30 uh, project managers. I've got my uh, security engineer, my security project manager there. And um, 
as we're going down the project and the process that's about to take place and uh, how we're going to need their developer resources and how we need their resources, um, as we get to that critical point, they, one of the gentlemen bursts out with an exasperated, why are we doing this? This is a waste of time. I don't care. And uh, this secu our security engineer had a nice, uh, had a polite discussion. Project manager had a polite discussion. Guy is escalating. So I cut in and I asked, so we have a policy memo that went from the CIO. It came through your chain of command. Budget has been allocated from outside your group in order to pay for this. What more do you need in order to figure out that this is important to everybody above you and make it important to you? Silence hits the room. And then there's a, one of the other project managers looks at him and says, I, I don't think you get it. These guys are your auditors. You're not going to get around them. You have to do what they say. And all of a sudden, everybody fell in line. But uh, until they understood that it was inevitable, until they understood that th they were wasting time fighting, they were going to waste time to prevent wasting time. They were going to try to wait, protect their developers. And even though there appeared to be compliance at that moment, every single step of the way, they were trying to prevent their, protect their developers. Oh, the architect's not available. The architect is available, but they can only answer specific questions. Let's go ahead and just guide this process. Because of the basic problem is that the business needs to manage security at a high level, and the developers are scarce. And from the, from the developer's perspective, they need to figure out how to get the risk reduced, not just for their application, but they've already rolled over to 10 to 15 other projects over the course of their life. So they're actually often managing a portfolio of applications, as are each of those project managers, as is the entire organization. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about, is how to solve that problem. Next. Gotcha. So, so what we've seen, seen already is there's a big push to secure the SDLC. That's good. We're seeing a big push left. That's good. Uh, but what about the existing portfolio of applications that are already in production? Um, so it's the uh, it's the the end of the year. It's the end of the year, and a uh, development manager who owns, at a different company, who owns a great many number of projects, uh, has called my manager's manager's manager into an office. We've got about 10, 15 people at the desk. And uh, the development manager is saying the exact same things that we have all heard a number of times. I, I'm going to name them. And if you've heard these things, go ahead and just raise your hand. Um, uh, can we uh, focus on the high priority items? Everybody. Uh, what about the false positives? Can we get rid of the false positives? Um, what if we only fix the low hanging fruit? Um, right, so everybody has heard all of those things. Everybody, he was of course repeating them all to us and our responses were probably the same thing that you did. Well, uh, based on the, the risk of your application and the type of vulnerability, we believe that all of these are in the high level of concern, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've had that conversation before, so I'm not going to go through the entire thing. And then he says, so what are you doing? You're just coming here and giving me a big pile of bugs. You're, you're just giving me a big mess. And I said, well, what you have to imagine is that you're in a cave. You don't know what's around you, and the job of information security is to shine a flashlight into all the little crevices of that cave so that you can see what's there. And he replies, but there's a bear there. And 
He says, you're just going to leave me with the bear? And here's the reality of the current system. Yes, that's exactly what we do. We leave them in a cave with a bear, so a general guideline that says, uh, you know, if you see cross-site scripting, OWASP, uh, the OWASP cheat sheet says this is how to fix it. P.S. You know, there's like 27 different uh, rules in the cheat sheet. Um, they're, they're, they're mostly correct. Um, some of them are hedging so that it's easier to understand. Um, but yeah, yeah, you should definitely try to keep all of those in mind for every single vulnerability. Oh, and by the way, you're going to fix it. We're going to tell you you fixed it wrong. And this is going to happen a few times. And it's going to go through all of your uh, development cycles. Because of course, they're immediately asking questions like, well, how do we, how do we pay for it? And every organization has a different answer to that, right? Uh, well, how do, you pay for, how do you pay for your normal bugs? Bugs? These, these aren't bugs. Yeah. Um, at some organizations, they say, well, we have this bucket here. We, we fund through it, right? Those, those are a lot easier conversations for us as security people because when they know that there's a, an easy path, fighting the developers turns into a much smoother conversation. So uh, now this is a development, uh, this is a development manager. Um, so he's actually not looking at a cave with one bear. What he's actually really looking at is a whole bunch of bears because he owns an entire division and he owns a lot of different applications. So another theme, the theme for this uh, for today is we think of application security. We think of a manual pen tester or going in or a automated uh, security analyst assessing a process, a, a, an application. That's how we compete with each other. Honestly, like, like if, if you pull back the veneer of we're all in this to make everything secure, and you ask the question, how, did, how do I keep my job? It's because I found something, and that guy didn't find anything that I didn't, right? At the end of the day, we're, pro we're providing that valuable information uh, and it might be high level information or it might be highly detailed information, but in some way we're providing a bit of information that somebody isn't, right? And so the tool vendors start, start competing with each other to show the most vulnerabilities. And then they show, start trying to show the most potential vulnerabilities. And then they start trying to show things that, you know, if you could get a really good analyst, which I actually do recognize a decent number of you in here, you're, you, these are you, they, you get a really good analyst, they might see a hint that might unlock the world, right? That's how the tools are competing with each other because that's how the sales cycle works and that's how we as buyers uh, request them. But then what happens when you bring that into an actual organization as you start trying to actually pull out an actual uh, uh, business process out of that. I dare you to run an analysis tool on an entire portfolio of 1,000 or 2,000 applications. Uh, Jeff Williams uh, was quoted yesterday in, in Hack News saying that there are like you know, two to 20,000 applications in an application portfolio for a major company is about right. I, that seems about right to me. And so if you're talking about 20,000 vulnerable applications times your basic report, uh, report stack, let's say it's uh, 200, uh, but, but that's unvalidated. So unvalidated, you're probably looking at 15,000, some odd. Uh, you, you can usually scale it down to about a quarter of that with just automated filtering, getting rid of things that you don't care. Uh, but you're still looking at a sea of vulnerabilities that are just so huge uh, that you can't really do anything meaningful there. So I, it, it actually wasn't surprising. After the, uh, after the, uh, the conversation with the bear, we, we did our annual report out. And we felt we'd done actually a, a really great job. Uh, 
We had a couple of engineers for roughly half a productive year. And uh, in addition to bringing out the processes and procedures and all of those things that you have to do and the buy-in and teaching and et cetera, et cetera, we had managed to bring, did, do we have that the slide? Uh, we, we had managed to bring, so we don't have it. Um, we had managed to, to bring together a solid 20-ish applications. Um, and we were showing a depth of understanding that into their portfolio that where we would say 500, one of their other analysis techniques would say five. And we're like, and we can defend every one of these. We, we have defended them to the developers, every one of those. So they were starting to see a really important conversation around what each application was doing. And, and we, we, we got our applauses and we were feeling really good. And then somebody says, 20 applications, that's, that I actually, had no, he wasn't an, an application developer, he says, 20 applications. I don't know if that's good or bad. How many applications are there in the company? Well, there's about 1,000 in the high risk model level, at this level. Do that math. You're talking about, what, what is it, 20 divided by 5, 50? 500? Five, five yeah, I don't know. I, she's the data, data scientist. That's a lot of years before you get through that portfolio. So you have this really good slice of data, um, and it's all important data, and it all needs to be actioned on. But to get through the whole portfolio, you're talking about an unreasonable number of years. And then, remember how long it takes to actually remediate that data. So the reason I said I dare you to run a scan across the entire app, uh, application portfolio and then report that back is because you'll get a response that I heard at, from a different manager. Uh, I, we, we, we were, uh, uh, I, I'm saying we is just a general part of our, our lives. Uh, part of my history over the last 20 years. Uh, we were a, at a consulting company that was very good at giving high level, specific, targeted advice on the architectural level. And they looked at us, uh, the manager said, are you guys gonna run another scanner? Because we already have a file cabinet full of scans that we can't touch because and then he went into legal things, talking about uh, uh, talking about uh, due diligence and due care, and if we actually know about it, and when we know about it. And then he starts talking about just how overwhelming it is for the developers. So imagine, so so if you do that giant scan, there's almost no chance that this that whatever your project was doesn't become shelfware. I, I've, I've never seen a project go to shelfware, but everybody who's talked to me about shelfware has that pattern in it. But it's a really hard conversation to have to talk your development managers out of doing that scan. It's so sexy. It's so attractive. Okay, you're in a cave, right? You've got a flashlight. There's a spider over there. Is there one up here? What about there? What about there? You want to know everything as quickly as possible. So you just kind of start shining it around so you can see something, right? Um, and you get this idea that if you go breath first, you'll get some information. But there's so many false positives that you wind up pulling, that, pulling those out. So um, let's see. Uh, so bit, but, Let's go to the, the next one. So, uh, oh, okay, so back one. So that's where the, the remediation side came in. Because we started asking the question, what can we do to help the developers? Because at a certain point, people are going to figure out that they're vulnerable. And then they're going to have to start reallocating resources to remediating that. And that's exactly what we did. So we, we went off and we figured out how to remediate cross-site scripting, uh, cross scripting in JSPs, and then we just started doing case studies to figure out how much it would fix. And uh, this is, 
and we chose the open source. Uh, we ordered, uh, we chose the uh, GitHub open source community for that. Now, it turns out that there are huge process and procedures problems in doing something that sh I thought back in March when we started this process, I thought this would actually be pretty straightforward. Um, you have a bunch of code, you can download the code, you can run the scanner, you can run the fixer, you can run the scanner, you can report the results. Um, these, these are things that you can do and because we're reporting the results not as a findings list, but as an actual pull request, like here, accept this and this many vulnerabilities go away, um, we thought that there would be, that it would be easy to gain acceptance. But what we've actually found is that at every step along the way, we were waved off from doing this. And so there's going to be a decent amount of, the com of conversation that we want to start having with the community, and, and I'm glad to see a lot of these folks here, because we weren't able to file the issue reports. I mean, we could have, but we were told in no uncertain terms, if you file these issue reports, you will piss a lot of people off. I, and we need to figure out exactly what that looks like. We, we, we did a little research into what responsible disclosure normally looks like. Seven days, 90 days, 45 days. Everybody bounces around in, in that range. But does responsible disclosure make, do those same rules make sense when you're giving a solution as opposed to a problem, right? Because you've just slow, narrowed their solutions or their solution time down so much that it shouldn't be an issue. We haven't been. We we need to have have that converse, continue to have that conversation because as a, as a as a realistic perspective. So this was a kind of our plan going in, and uh, how the this, and it still uh, is the general framework how we conducted uh, the case study. But we did have um, some snags operationally and um, in terms of. Uh, working with GitHub, which we, we worked with them on a lot of the aspects uh, for downloading, because when you're downloading uh, 160,000 repositories, uh, it turns out like you need to work with them a little bit. They're not used to that kind of load. So um, first off, I'll kind of go into a little bit about the, about the project. Um, Fozzy has kind of mentioned a lot of these things at this point, but um, the inspiration was really that we knew we could help other people with this tool and we wanted to have some proof of concept. Um, and, uh, but a big part of that too is also the sample diversity that you get there. Because you have a, a, a wide variety of programmer skill that's putting code out there. You have um, different coding standards that are being used. You have different uh, contribution con uh, constraints. There's a lot of, some, some projects have a lot of collaboration, so you have a whole bunch of contributors, and those get a lot of attention and a lot of help when, well, where they're needed. And then there's other projects that, that don't. And um, when we were evaluating these things, this makes a big difference. So, um, kind of going into that, that was actually a really, big reason as to why, uh, or the value that we got out of being able to apply it to such a diverse sample. Um, so for the goals, uh, again, uh, proof of concepts and getting uh, additional edge case code for our own tool, because a lot of our tool uh, remediates most of XSS, but there are edge cases and we wanted to have exposure to other cases to make sure that we actually have a, a, an even better tool. Uh, so improving our own side as well. And then also with the data that we get, really identifying where are the opportunities uh, 
um, for kind of growing this type of technology? Is it in expanding it to more languages and expanding it to more vulnerabilities? Uh, like what, what is actually the best way to provide the most value going forward? So um, with all of this, um, we did, for our, for our quality control, we did use a third party uh, scanning service, FindSec Bugs, uh, before and after, so we could kind of audit our results rather than just reporting, uh, just <laughs> rather than just being the only source uh, of, of data for that. So uh, we, everything that we did was for Java and specifically JSPs. And so why Java? And Java and, and .NET are consistently um, the highest areas of concern. And that's because of just their, their broad range in, like, in applications throughout the business world. When you're looking at like most financial companies or at least they're most airline companies, you have major, major industries that are very, very highly Java centric. So when you so that just means that it has to be prioritized when you have when you have when you have problems. And this has been reiterated in the in the sound state of application security for like the last two years and before that too, but this is the most recent. Um, again, it's it's not that the languages themselves are problematic, inherently problematic. It's that you have such a broad uh, usage of them that if someone can uh, take advantage of certain vulnerabilities, they can scale it a lot better. Right? You can get scale. So. That makes it really important to fix things. <laughs> um, and then the next thing is why XSS. So um, in 2011, uh, Denon Group actually provided a study on, because it's only 20 plus samples, so um, there's a bit of a, a sample size issue, but it's really useful to kind of look at um, what kinds of vulnerabilities uh, you see, like the distribution, and uh, by sample count, and then they provided the average fix times. Um, but if you kind of multiply that out and kind of evaluate, well, how much time does that really mean is being spent for each of these types of uh, vulnerabilities? Because if it's a whole bunch of them and they're a super easy fix, is that better or worse than you know, a much smaller number, but it just takes a lot longer. Um, so, if you just want to go by time spent on vulnerabilities, you're looking at, I mean, XSS is over 43% of the vulnerabilities found, and then they take over 47% of the time for remediation. So, if we're going to go after one uh, vulnerability type, we got the most thing for our buck here. Um, so whether you're looking for, uh, whether you're trying to reduce the number of vulnerabilities or uh, reduce severity, you're, you're doing pretty, pretty well if you can get rid of just the XSS. Uh, so uh, what we did was go into to, uh, GitHub for this, for our data sources, uh, we had uh, the code from GitHub, and I think something to kind of note about the code from GitHub is its inherent nature. It, I mean, it launched in 2008. It has all there. Some people did post older code on, on there afterwards, but for the most part, you're looking at code that's been developed within the last 10 years um, or less mostly less. Uh, and so it's, there has been a big push for more secure development. Um, and so it's not necessarily representative of the uh, legacy code that you see in larger organizations. 
because that hasn't undergone like the same um, level of scrutiny in the, in the in the development process, right? So there's already going to be fewer uh, vulnerabilities, ideally. And then uh, for us, we were just looking at JSPs. And um, many of the uh, many of the projects are not robust enough to really require a whole bunch of uh, JSPs, even if it's a Java repository. So um, there's some there's some kind of interesting things when you're taking uh, GitHub <laughs> as a sample set. Um, the next thing. Uh, so, for for example, um, since 2008, there have been a uh, big shift from uh, JSP development over to Android development. There aren't any JSPs in Android development, so all of those projects are just going to wind up being nothing. Um, also, a lot of projects uh, don't have a front end when you're dealing with uh, a lot of the open source projects because uh, it turns out people don't make a lot of uh, server software uh, in the open source community. Um, like your bank runs runs uh, runs on J JSPs, but they didn't pull that from an open source project in most cases. There are some out there, uh, and we, we tried to find them, but we really didn't have great success trying to, to find those. Um, but um, that's that's a lot of what she's talking about, right? Like uh, um, most of the Apache commons, there's no, uh, there's no JSPs in that. So that's kind of giving you a sense of, of what's happening to the, the sample set. Uh, uh, so um, when we started looking at gathering data for it, we have kind of two major sources. We have the third party of uh, vulnerability reports. So before, after looking at what types of vulnerabilities were there, um, what kind of distribution, um, and we can, and it identifies you know, exactly which, uh, e each individual vulnerability. So we can kind of see um, what in our remediation process, the actual impact that we're having each time for each, uh, code suggestion, right? So, and then again, afterwards, the, the post, uh, the post analysis there. And for this though, there were, we started running against uh, the over 160,000 GitHub repositories and finding that uh, projects with JSPs uh, are actually a very small percentage of that. We kind of, uh, kind of stopped um, running through the, in, the entirety of that and focused on the, on starting to run through the uh, 808,000 individual JSPs. So that's JSPs. So there are um, repositories that contain multiple JSPs. So it doesn't quite tie, but the way that uh, GitHub search fun like functionality works, you can't necessarily separate it the same way. Um, and when we're doing that, we're also collecting data on the uh, repositories themselves. So their age, um, how recently they've been updated, um, how many open issues, because we're looking at like when it comes down to uh, not only the security level that that, that repository is, is, is at, but also um, how open they are to suggestions uh, for remediation. We want to see like what kind of behavioral characteristics are kind of feeding into that. So, what are going through our results? Uh, we did find that the presence of vulnerabilities was actually really bursty. Like you'd find an, uh, one repository that had one, and then you'd find like 20 to 30 in another, and then like one that had like 250, right? And so you have this really, um, it's really bursty, even though there's still like a, a couple here and there. And 
when you look at that, I mean, it, it kind of also makes sense because there's a lot of, um, so repositories that had a lot of um, user contributors and that were more built out uh, tended to have fewer vulnerabilities. And I mean, that kind of can be expected because you're getting more and more involvement and making sure that it is safe. And so if there were vulnerabilities before, someone has already come in to try and fix that. Um, so community involvement in these projects is really, really important because the repositories that we found that had the most, um, in most cases, they were not, they either weren't being maintained very or recently or they, um, had a very limited number of contributors, um, often one. So, uh, again, um, we also found a really high presence in test code, which, I mean, a lot of times people think that their test code doesn't have to be secure, but there's people, one, for one, there's people who are forking their test code and then <laughs> using that test code for other things, and so that kind of multiplies. Then you have, um, it's, it also means that people are in test environments that are actually simulating something that's not the actual uh, environment if the actual environment has those security uh, protocols, right? So, um, and then another big thing was the fort of repositories. So a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of the uh, repositories that still had a lot of vulnerabilities were forked from repositories that are well maintained. And so those origin repositories um, had much lower vulnerability counts than many of the forks because those people are not updating, they're not rebasing, uh, they're not getting the uh, most recent updates from the master branch. And so they just keep those vulnerabilities going on. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one of the, the, two, the two things that are, I'd like to make sure you take away from this. Uh, the first is we saw a ton of struts to branches, uh, struts to forks, which means, uh, so the, the Equifax hack was based off of a, a known vulnerability that was report back, reported back in struts to back in, uh, I believe it was March, mm -hmm. and March of this year. So anybody who forked before that isn't getting those automatic, automated updates. And where that applies to us as defenders and generally not defenders of the open source community, but de defenders of your, uh, of your, your corporate castles, um, a lot of us have clients that have centralized uh, security controls. And a lot of those clients also have a process for fo internal forking of those same APIs. And whether it's security controls or other APIs, um, we've seen again and again that uh, there's this weird thing that happens because uh, if we detect a vulnerability in, the, in a piece of fork code, uh, they, maybe they fix it, or maybe they say, hey, it's also vulnerable over there, so why don't they fix it and then we'll bring it forward at some later theoretical rebasing, oh, but that's probably going to be complicated. And so you actually see uh, this same phenomenon manifesting inside of uh, internal large internal organizations as well. And it's, so it's, 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 again, we're talking about open source, but every bit of this parallels to what we're seeing in major organizations as well. Please continue. Um, yeah, especially they have their own uh, kind of frameworks built on top of standardized uh, programs. So, um, for things that are XSS specific, um, again, like older repositories, they were significantly uh, more likely to have more XSS vulnerabilities. Um, newer code had less, but it's still there, it still has a presence. Um, it's not, <laughs> it's, it, even though uh, there's a lot more knowledge and there's a lot more tools to make sure it, it doesn't, we never have it, um, things do slip through. And um, 
the uh, we found some, someone something similar for uh, well for XSS specifically. Once we started narrowing it down to JSPs, then there's even a higher incidence of XSS because of the nature of JSPs. So. Um, but that's not necessarily representative of programs as a whole. Um, so when we started going into this, um, we, I don't know if you want to talk about like kind of the, net, the net impact yeah. and um, kind of distribution because yeah. we found like we could, we could get a lot of Bing for a buck just taking out whole sets of uh, test repositories or uh, forked repositories that are all very, pretty much the same thing. And so you can like scale that validation uh, afterwards a lot easier. Yeah. So um, what we, you know, we, again, we, we, we don't want this to become a, a product demo. So uh, what we want to want to get uh, people, get everybody thinking about here is what is that point where you have enough automated remediation that it makes sense to run this at scale, right? If, if it's one, one vulnerability out of, uh, out of your entire portfolio, you probably don't care that you, you fixed it. But uh, because of the development costs that, that are involved. But if you were able to knock out 20% of your, uh, of if you were able to knock out specific classes of vulnerability, is that something where it starts to make sense to run across your entire uh, portfolio? Because even because the, the time costs start switching, and hopefully I'm not going too far into what you're ta about to talk about, uh, because the time costs start switching. Um, so uh, imagine, uh, imagine what happens if instead of a vulnerability report that takes about two years to do the remediation, um, you are instead uh, running through everything, automatically creating an issue, and then automatically creating a pull request that so that they can see the diffs, the actual diffs to fix the code. And so now, either at the point when they are coming back around to do the next remediate, uh, to do their next fix, or they have a team going through and pulling these uh, pull fixes in, uh, the sorry pull requests in. You're, you're able to start moving it in that direction. So we were looking at getting a, a, about 20% of existing cross-site scripting uh, based on the types of XSS that I've seen throughout organizations in the year, uh, throughout the years. Um, so uh, a lot of the exotic stuff, we just don't touch, right? Because uh, we, we're all, a lot of us are static and analysts here, right? The false positive to false error rates get really ugly really fast. But the tools tend to know a decent amount about a little bit. And if you, you scope everything down really tightly, and then you ask a couple of clear, clear questions, you can start remediating entire sections of it. Um, can we open up for questions? I, I want to make sure that we have a little bit. Um, OK. I mean, I think it is kind of important to kind of stress oh, the please. responsible disclosure um, aspect, especially because we went into this uh, a big uh, draw was that we'd be able to discuss a lot of our findings, uh, but then we were uh, actually asked by GitHub not to um, not to issue a lot of to, not to create a lot of the issues that we were planning. Um, with, which even e even though we had uh, kept those at a higher level, just vulnerability counts um, and then not follow up with a pull request because of review time. They thought it would be such a, they thought it would actually create a, a much bigger security threat, especially when you have people, if they don't accept the pull request, then it's out there and it's not being fixed. And it's a very public nature in how issues are created and um, pull requests are sent. I so that's all public. So we are in the process of finding ways to do this in a more private fashion and contacting them individually um, so that it's, it's not uh, publicly available. 
So, and and we, we, we appreciate their, their concerns, and, and some of the concerns that you mentioned were things that GitHub mentioned and some that were mentioned by others uh, talking, in talking about responsible disclosure. Um, we think that this is different. We, we, we think that when you're, when you're uh, we, we think that the, the goal of open source is that everybody is going in and pitching in. And so uh, this feels like a software developer going in and saying, hey, I found a fix and, and here is the fix. And I feel like if I was writing that software, I would want that. Um, but we respect that there are different views and, and we decided to make it a conversation rather than uh, just enforce our view on everybody. The, the world's uh, not going to change if we, we take a pause to have that conversation. Uh, we do want you to send us your opinions um, because we, 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 we did the research and we just couldn't find a, a great answer. So. Yeah, we'd like to be able to send them in. Um, they are requesting more of an opt-in format uh, and that's kind of where they want to go. That's why they have um, a lot of plugins you can use for us. That's, that's what they are trying to push. So this isn't quite the structure that they uh, would like. So. And, uh, and we do plan on publishing everything, even, even within the responsible disclosure community. Uh, at most, they, they are gonna get 90 days before we publish it. So we're, we're really likely to, to publish. Uh, so if you wanna get in contact with us, we'd, we'd love to get you like hard data. Um, and so, I mean, uh -huh. she's a data scientist. This is, <coughs> it's killing her that she can't show you numbers. <laughs> um. And it's my baby. I really want to show it. <laughs> um, but just to kind of at least illustrate kind of the concept of what we're, we're what we are talking about um, for comparing um, remediating one vulnerability type over the entirety of a, of, of a portfolio versus a more traditional approach of going into an application and just looking to remediate everything with it, be done with it, and move on to the next. Um, when you do something like that, it's, it's very satisfying to have your entire project cleared, and it, feel, it feels good. But in the end, if you have you know, a, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so if, if you have a, a lot more vulnerabilities in your portfolio, and you only get a percentage of them, you can still end up with significantly more progress corporate-wide, uh, rather than just, uh, tick boxes that you can say are actually fully complete. So. So, um, so here's some additional resources. Um, uh, if you'd like to get in on that conversation, um, so here's a bunch of the resources that we use. If you'd like to get in, into a conversation with us about uh, how, especially responsible disclosure um, and the, the general uh, automated remediation movement that's starting, um, we're really interested in that conversation. Please uh, send us a line, um, take, a, take a photo. Uh, there are going to be a lot of conversations, uh, more conversations about remediation. Uh, there are also some existential questions. Like, like my perspective was that the AI was a person, and so a person doing this would have been totally normal, just faster. And that was clearly not what every person felt about it. So. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I'm interested in those discussions. So uh, our time is up. We're going to clear. Thank you very much.